Talking about, yeah, talking about a wonderful yeah. guest speaker. Well, I, wouldn't that just be horrible if you, you hear, hear all these great things and then the speaker comes up and it's like the worst message you've ever heard in your life, you know? <laughs> You're leaving like, man, I'm confused. I don't know if I'm saved, unsaved, or what, you know? But anyways, my name is William Wood. I am so excited to be here. I'm so glad to be here. I just want to give a personal thanks to pastors um, Ben and Micah for it. This allowed me to come and share. I just, I, I just love doing it. I just love sharing the Word of God and as you can tell my, by my accent, I am from uh, South Alabama. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You have any Southern people here? <laughs> Just me. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> as you know, we've been in a series the past four or five weeks. Pastors uh, Ben and Micah have done a great job with this how-to series that we've been doing. And what I want to do is I want to continue in this series with a, with a message that God has put on my heart for the past five years, and that is how to manage our soul. How of us know God has intended us to, to live from the inside out, not from the outside in? Amen? That he's called us to be internally controlled and not externally controlled. If we're externally controlled, then our behavior is determined by the condition of our environment. But when we're internally controlled, our behavior is determined by the condition of the internal truth that we live by, right? And we're called to live from that internal reality. But before I get into today's message, I just want to kind of share a story with you about my journey on learning how to manage my, manage my soul. And I can remember back 10 years ago now, I'm May 31st, 2005, that's when I gave my life to the Lord. And I remember when I first met Jesus, how much freedom that was brought to me and how much excitement that I had in my life and in my heart. And I mean, I just felt so holy on the inside when I met Jesus. I mean, it was just amazing. I was like, man, I'm, the, I'm a holy man. I mean, I mean, it completely changed me. It's in one moment, I was completely delivered of drugs and alcohol. Just in one moment. And I, I mean, really to the point, I didn't go to church. I didn't grow up in church or anything like that. And this is literally what I did. I went home and I started watching TBN, you know. Anybody watch TBN? Anybody fell asleep watching TBN? Come on. Be real. I want you to pray for me this morning. I have a little cold as well. Uh, a little bit of sickness is trying to come, and, come against me. And I, can, I can feel it um, now as I'm trying to speak with you. Um, so just be praying. Pray, be praying for me. But I would literally... Satan will not win, right? But I would literally watch TBN, watch these movies about Jesus, and, and try to act like what I was seeing on TV. Like I didn't have any understanding of Jesus whatsoever, but except for what I was seeing in the movies. You know, in the movies, I would always portray Jesus. He's wearing this gown. He walk around. You're like, how are you doing, my son? How are you doing, my daughter? You know? And so literally, I was like, you just have to know me, know my personality, I guess. But when, when I change my life, I, I, when I'm going to do right, I'm going to do right. When I'm going to do wrong, I'm going to do wrong. So I'm like really extreme with the thing, those things that I do. I really give myself to them. And so what I would literally start doing, thank you. So what I would literally start doing was trying to mimic what I was watching on TV. And I was working at this chemical company at the time. And I started walking around this chemical company like, how can I help you, my son? <laughs> how can I help you, my daughter? I'm like, oh, my God. When I think back, I was like, man, William, you're a nut, you know. And I would say this to people like, they're like 60, you know. And I'm 20 years old. I put my arm around this old guy, and I'm like, hey, can, how can I help you, my son? You know, and I'm trying to help people out, and eventually people started sitting me down and says, William, listen, 
we, we love that you experienced this freedom that you've experienced. We love that you have encountered God the way that you have encountered. But this, this holier-than-thou attitude that you have has got to come to an end. I mean, it needs to stop. And I remember after three or four months of that, after experiencing this overwhelming freedom in my life, this overwhelming freedom in my heart, this holiness that I couldn't explain, I remember after three or four months of that, it seemed like all of a sudden life began to hit me again. And some of you may be in here this morning, you may have experienced freedom at some point in your life. You have may have encountered Jesus Christ and experienced exactly what that, that liberty and that holiness feels like, but all of a sudden, life. Is begun to hit you again. And you may be in here this morning, you may be feeling like life is having you rather than you having life. But I have some hope for you this morning. I have some encouragement for you this morning. I have some good news for you this morning. The Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That when you give yourself to him, he will walk with you, he will walk in you, and he will live through you. Amen? And so what I want to do this morning is I want to invite you on this journey of some things that I have learned over the years of how to manage my soul in difficult seasons in life. And as much as we love Christmas and as much as we love the season that we're in right now, how many of us know at the same time it could be one of the most difficult seasons to be in because of lost loved ones? because of memories of years past, of, of things that we've gone through. It's just another year, another reminder of something that has happened. But if we're going to learn how to manage our soul, I believe there are two facts that we must understand, that we must know before we learn how to manage our soul. In fact, number one is this right here. One of the biggest battlefields in your life is in your mind. And I have a video here to illustrate this point, a very serious video. Here we go. All right, open. Hmm, this looks new. Think it's safe? What is it? Uh, okay, caution. There is a dangerous smell, people. Hold on, what is that? This is disgust. She basically keeps Riley from being poisoned, physically and socially. That is not brightly colored or shaped like a dinosaur. Hold on, guys. It's broccoli! <laughs> yes! I just saved our lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're welcome. Riley, if you don't eat your dinner, you're not gonna get any dessert. Wait, did he just say we couldn't have dessert? That's anger. He cares very deeply about things being fair. So that's how you wanna play it, old man? No dessert? Oh, sure. We'll eat our dinner right after you eat this. Ah! Riley, ah! Riley, here comes an airplane. Ah! Oh. Airplane. We got an airplane, everybody. <laughs> Can anyone relate to that at all? Anybody with kids relate to that? <laughs> How many of us know that the thoughts that you entertain determines if your mind becomes a prison or a place of liberty? What you tolerate will dominate. The thoughts that we entertain determines if our mind, if our soul, becomes a prison or a place of liberty. And understanding this one fact right here is going to help us so much in learning how to manage our soul. It's going to help us so much understanding the dynamic of what we are entertaining in our minds. And I promise you. And when I started learning this and when God started teaching me this principle, I noticed that 95% of my issues were just simply me. <laughs> it was just simply because the thoughts that I was entertaining, I realized I had anxiety because I was meditating on thoughts that was producing that emotion. Anxiety is the product of you meditating on something negative in your life. Which brings me to the next fact, the second fact I believe we need to understand if we're going to learn how to manage our soul. And that is number two, not every thought that we have is ours. Not every thought that you have in your mind is yours. 
And so what I want to do this morning is I want to share with you four sources that I have learned over the years. Four sources that our thoughts come from and how we can learn to identify these four sources and then learn how to manage our soul. And the first source of, that our thoughts come from is this right here. Thoughts come from us. Well, yes, I know that, William. Thoughts come from me. So what I want to do is I want to share with you my journey. Now, if this relates to you, great. If it doesn't, then, you know, I hope it helps in some way, some, some form, some, somehow. But for me, it's always been a struggle of insecurity in my life. My entire family is this, this really just an insecure family. And I, and I just noticed that it was so difficult for me that a lot of my issues were just my own insecurity. Listen, insecurity will create false conspiracies that masquerade as reality. It will create this false world in your mind that you believe is real, that in actuality, it's not. I, me I remember I would walk into the room and I would hear people laughing and talking and I would think they were laughing and talking about me. And I, and I would literally start asking people, are you talking about me, man? They're like, William, you're not that important. <laughs> I'm not thinking about you. <laughs> thinking about her. Not playing. I'm just playing. But I would literally go into places like that where there's all this insecurity, and I would have this false world created in my mind that was masquerading as reality. It was convincing me that that was reality and that was the way that it is. Well, the only thing it was, was something I was believing. It was just something that I was believing in and of myself. It was my own thoughts. It was my own thoughts putting me in a place of bondage. You see, some of us in here this morning, it's your own insecurity that has you in prison. That the thoughts that you're entertaining, the prison that you're in, is a prison that you put yourself there it's a false reality. It's not even real, and it's really not even a prison. All you have to do is realize I have put my insecurity is just putting your security in the wrong source. It's, security is finding your identity in Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. The more you discover who he is, the more you discover who you are. The more you find yourself in him, the more you discover your created purpose. You see, everybody's born an original, but most people die a copy. ha. <laughs> When you find yourself in him, you don't have to worry about those insecurities anymore. You don't have to worry about those thoughts anymore, creating these false realities, because you realize, man, I am loved by the creator. I am I found in him, and by identifying him, and by finding my source of security in him, I am secure in who I am. I believe this one area right here, all of us have areas that we're dealing with of insecurity. What I feel like the Lord wants to do this morning, I feel like he wants to cut off some things this morning. He wants to cut off some false realities that we have in ourselves that we have produced on our own. And he wants to shift some things. The second source that our thoughts come from is that they come from others. What do you mean? How many times have someone said something to you and then you went home and just thought about it over and over and over and over, right? It's like they deposited this thought in your mind and all of a sudden you have made this thing to become more than what it is, right? I've been in conversations and people just you know, flippantly said things, and I went home like, man, what do they mean by that? And all of a sudden, I just went off into this whole different area that it should have never been. And what I noticed with my own life is it was the voices of the people that always hurt me. It was that unforgiveness that I had toward people that hurt me. And even though they may not have been in my life for the past five years or ten years, just the memory of them, it was as if they were still present in my life. 
You see, unforgiveness tethers you to the past. Unforgiveness is the lifeline is the lifeline that empowers the past into your present. Even though that person may not no longer be in your life, but they're still tormenting you because the what they said to you, what they did to you is still present in your memories. God wants to so renew your mind, he wants to redefine your memories. I have a friend of mine, he, he called me uh, several months ago, and he has this prison ministry in, in Alabama. And this prison that he was going to actually allowed him to come in to do this men's conference for all these men. And, and the theme of the conference was forgiveness. But what he didn't realize was there were two people in this prison. A son was just, a, a, a man was just transferred to this prison where his father was there, but he didn't know it. This, this young man didn't know that his father was in prison, and his father had abandoned him as, as a child. But this one man, this young man that came to the prison all of his life, every single night, he would sit in bed, and he would just think of ways to torment his father. He would just think of ways that the next time that he would see him, I'd say, I'm going to kill him the next time I see him. And he would just think of ways to, to torment him and to, to get back at him if he ever encountered his father again. Well, my, my, my pastor friend was doing this conference, and he was teaching on forgiveness, and they were breaking up into small groups, and they were teaching on forgiveness. On forgiveness. And as this, as this young man was in the small group, and as they began to teach on forgiveness, all of a sudden the Spirit of God began to hit his heart. And he began to just break down and weep. And he, and he began to say to God, God, I don't want this unforgiveness in my heart towards my father anymore. And as soon as he said those words, guess who he saw? He, he saw his father. And immediately this, this war began inside of him of all those emotions trying to overtake him against it. I want to kill him. He has hurt me. He has beat me. He has broken me down. And he had this war going on inside of him, but he knew in his heart, he said, I, have, I need to do something about this. Then they all got back together in the main conference, in the main auditorium, and, and this boy was sitting there, and he was just broken on the inside. He said, I have to do something about this. He walks up to my pastor friend, and he says, can I have the mic? I have something I need to say. He grabs the mic, and he, look, he walks down, he looks at his father, he says, he says, Dad, he says, you have abandoned me, you have neglected me, you have beaten me, you have molested me, and you have done nothing but been a deadbeat father to me. But here's what I say to you. I forgive you. And immediately the power of God comes into this conference, comes into this prison, and every single man in the, in the prison begins to weep and begins to forgive people and begins to walk and the power of forgiveness, letting the people go that have hurt them in life. And every single man in that prison gave their life to the Lord. Amen. Some of us may be in here this morning, and you may be locked in this prison in your soul, and the voice that took you there or the vo is the voice of the people that's hurt you. The voice of the people that has spoken negative against you, that you have harbored in your soul. And I like to call this place a place of reflection. Because the only thing you can see is the pictures and the faces and the voices of the people that have hurt you. I believe God wants to cut that off this morning. I believe God wants to set you free from that place of reflection. I believe God wants to set you free. So that you can begin to hear his voice and to begin to hear his truth into your heart. You see, when the Lord finally began to deal with me about this, I started calling people. Even people that I heard, I called every single person that came to my mind that I ever heard and I asked them to, to forgive me. And the Lord took me through every single person that ever hurt me in life. And I forgave them. And when I forgave them, I felt myself stepping into freedom more and more and more and more. And to the point now, it's like I have so much forgiveness in my heart. To the point where people's actions no longer determine my actions. Your bad actions will never determine my good actions.
the third voice or the third source that our thoughts come from is they come from Satan. How many of us know this? You see, what Satan does is he tries to put this thought in your mind This doesn't have any power at all. Listen, it doesn't have any power at all. But he, he introduces this idea to you. And by your human agreement to the idea, you empower the thought. And then your faith creates its reality. Did we get that? You see, it doesn't have any thoughts at all, I mean any power at all, until you say, I agree to that. You see, Satan doesn't try to convince you that he's God. He tries to convince you that he's you. He tries to convince you that that thought is your thought. He tries to convince you that that thought that he's given you is all you so that he can just leave you alone because then your faith creates the reality of what he just spoke. You see, some of us in here this morning, you've never seen the real you. You, When you look in the mirror, you're just seeing the image of the lie you are believing. Because when you listen to Satan and you believe his lies, you literally become the image of the lie you believe. You see, some of us in here this morning are looking in the mirror, and, we, we, you, and you're hating yourself, and you're, you're, you're d- disgusted with yourself, and you don't realize you're just, you're just at disgust with the lie that you're looking at in the mirror. But Jesus wants to come and give you truth. Jesus wants to come and let you look into the mirror and see yourself the way you were created to be. You see, I didn't realize I had a voice. I was convinced that I didn't have a voice. I was convinced that no one could love me. I was convinced that no one would ever listen to me when I would stand up. But now I know that I have been anointed to preach the word of God. Now I know I am a son of the most high God. Now I know I have a voice that carries the Father's authority that when I speak, People's lives get changed. I refuse to allow lies to conform me to their image. You become the image of the greatest truth or the greatest lie you believe. The fourth source our thoughts come from is they come from God. Some of us know that this is the thought that we want to have in our mind. Romans chapter 8, verse 6. I know I'm just now getting to some scripture. But this is okay, right? For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. To be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Listen, every thought that comes from God is going to produce two things in your life. Life in peace. If, what you, if, you're, if you are a believer this morning in the life that you're living and you're not experiencing peace in your heart, then you may need to evaluate if you're listening to God's voice or not. You may need to evaluate who you're really listening to because if you have the thoughts of God in your mind, in your heart, you will be a person of peace. You will walk in wholeness. Amen? Amen? You will walk in this overwhelming life inside of you. You see, what I want to do this morning is I just want to take you on this place of learning how to manage our soul now. I've taught you, uh, well, I showed you four sources of how to identify where thoughts come from and where these voices come from so that we can know the angles that, that the enemy and the, and, the, and the things are coming against us as. But now I want to share with you just three simple steps. Something I do all the time on how to manage my soul. And the first one is this right here. Identify God's truth. Simple, right? John 8, 31 and 32 says this. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had, who had believed him, if you abide in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. And you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Isn't that amazing? How do you know you're believing a lie if you don't have truth to compare it to?
Everyone say this after me. The Bible is God speaking to me. The more you get in his word, the more equipped you are to identify Satan's lies. Truth always will expose a lie. Every time you embrace a truth, you destroy a lie. And so what I started doing in my life is I started just identifying God's truth about me. God, what do you say about me? God, what does your word say about me? And every time I, I identified his truth, it, sh it revealed in me a false belief. It revealed in me a lie that I was believing. But then I still had a choice. To let go of this lie and take a hold of this truth or just remain holding on to something that I've held precious for so long that has now become part of my identity. Some of you in here this morning, you may have believed a lie for so long that now you're afraid. It's become part of so much part of who you are. Now you're afraid that the truth is not as good as they say it is. You see, listen, truth is the universal key to the door of bondage. Truth provides the opportunity for freedom. But it's still upon us as people to step into the freedom truth provides. Are we okay this morning? Some of us are sitting in this prison cell. We have truth has opened the prison cell. Truth has opened the door, and we're sitting there saying, I am afraid. To step into the freedom truth is provided. Listen, what I want to do this morning is I don't feel like God wants to do this morning. He wants to give you the strength to embrace his truth. He wants to give you the strength to say, you know what? I'm sick and tired of living this way. I'm sick and tired of, of feeling this way. I'm sick and tired of allowing this lie to define me. But now I'm going to step into what God has ordained for me. The more I started doing this, the more I started seeing what God has put purpose, purpose for me. And the more freedom I began to walk in as an individual. And the more I learned how to be internally controlled. And the more I was able to go inside any environment and become an influence into that environment. Rather than the environment becoming an influence to me. You see, I don't believe that we're called to be products of our environment. You see, Jesus loved hanging around who? Sinners. And guess what? Sinners loved hanging around Jesus, the real Jesus. If sinners, well, I'm going to say that, but if people that are lost do not like hanging around us, are we carrying the real Jesus? Let me say it this way. Am I representing the Jesus that's in Scripture? And people that hang around me, and they don't love me, and they don't say, hey, man, I just love being around this guy. He brings so much life to me. If people hang around me and they feel condemned, am I really representing the Jesus of Scripture? Because people love being around him. God wants to bring truth into your life this morning. He wants to awaken your soul this morning, and he wants to allow that truth to expose every area that contradicts his word. The second way of managing our thoughts is removing our false beliefs. Number one, you have to identify God's truth. You don't know you're believing a lie until you have truth to expose it. But then you still have this choice. I'm, am I going to remove this lie or am I still going to entertain it? Am I still going to allow it to abide? You see, I've chosen to live my life in a way where I refuse to believe anything that's not in Scripture. I refuse. This Scripture is the foundation of my belief system. Anything else is not worthy of it. And we allow truth to become the foundation of our belief system. 
All of a sudden, we are empowered and we are equipped to look at those lies of Satan and say, no, I'm not listening. I'm not entertaining this anymore. But we have to be humble enough to know that truth that God has, it may be a little scary, and we may have to change. We may have to change. That's the biggest issue for us as people is the changing. It's the, can I really do this? Can I really change? 2 Corinthians chapter 10 says this. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not walk according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God. For the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Wow. Listen, strongholds are developed in your life through patterns of thought that are inconsistent with God's word. Did I just say that okay? Strongholds are developed in your life through patterns of thought that are inconsistent with God's truth, God's word. The Bible says to take every thought captive. It doesn't say take some. It doesn't say take every negative thought captive because that's that's the way we read it, right? How many times times do we only rebuke the negative thoughts? How many of us know Satan's okay with you going to hell with a positive attitude? (laughs) This thing is much more than than positive thinking. This is, this, is, this is submitting our mind to the mind of Christ and developing his mindset. It says to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. It means I am constantly submitting everything that I am to his word and to his will. And I'm allowing everything that he is to transform everything that I am. Regardless of the way it makes me feel, regardless of what I think about it, I know what he says is truth. See, I love encounters. I love experiencing the presence of God. But I don't allow my experience to guide my beliefs. Experience apart from God's word will develop false beliefs that lead you astray. Every experience or every encounter I have with God, I'll always take it to his word. If I have an experience that contradicts his word, then guess what? That experience may not have come from the King of kings and the Lord of lords. It's time that we start submitting ourselves to God's word. It's time that we start taking our every thought captive to the obedience of Christ and allowing him. Come on. I'll get excited if nobody else will. To change everything that we are. I talk about learning how to manage our soul. I really had to put these principles into action three years ago when my brother was murdered. And I had to go to the murderer, and I had to be able to stand there and look at them and be okay. And I had to preach my brother's funeral. It was a difficult time to have to look at that person and say, I forgive you. It was hard. It was a hard thing to go through. But these principles got me through them. I didn't allow myself to slip under a lie. I didn't allow myself to fall away from what I knew was truth. I did the third thing right here. Is I developed a godly thinking pattern. So that's how you manage your thoughts. That's how you manage your soul. Is number one, you identify God's truth. Number two, you remove false beliefs. And number three, you develop godly thinking patterns. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good, 
an acceptable and perfect will of God. You don't have to watch what you do if you watch what you think. (laughs) You sow a thought, you reap an action. You sow an action, you reap a habit. You sow a habit, you reap a lifestyle. You sow a lifestyle, you reap a destiny. Today's thoughts is shaping tomorrow's destiny. There's a divine connection between what you're thinking right now and what you're fulfilling tomorrow. What you're thinking is much more important than what you realize. What we are entertaining in ourselves is much more important than what we realize. The Bible says, it puts it, it says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may be able to prove what the will of God is. The renewing of your mind is the unveiling of God's will. The more your mind is renewed by his word and his truth, the more his will is revealed to you. And the more you're positioned to prove his will, so that you may be able to prove what the will of God is, that which is good, perfect, and acceptable. Wow. Isn't that amazing? God has put such an emphasis on the transformation of our soul, on the renewing of our mind. I feel like us as believers, we need to start paying a little more attention to it, right? I feel like what God wanted to do this morning is he wanted to deposit something into us as a body of people to help us navigate through life and help us navigate through the things that the enemy tries to throw at us, that life tries to throw at us. And I promise you, as you apply these principles, you will realize that 90% of the, the issues are just found right here. Jesus said stumbling blocks are inevitable, which means stumbling blocks will come, but I feel like we create 90% of them. I believe our faith attracts more (laughs) than what we should encounter. Every eye closed and every head bowed. I just want you to repeat this after me. I am a son and a daughter. I have the mind of Christ. Soul, I command you now to think with the thoughts of God. I am walking in freedom. I am yielded to the Holy Spirit. And I thank you, Jesus, for setting me free. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Chantel, could you just come on up for me, please? I have asked Chantel to um, come stand over inside for me. To get together some words of knowledge for me. But what she doesn't realize, what she doesn't know, is that I'm not actually going to let her give words of knowledge this morning. I have something else in mind, something else planned that I want to do. And you get to be part of it. So can you, are we okay with that? I purposely try to shorten my message for this, so bear with me, okay? But there's some things I just wanted to share with Chantel, and I was wanted to let everyone here know about it because this is my f- church family. You know, 18 months ago, Chantel, when I moved to Pennsylvania, I didn't tell you this, but um, I basically lost all hope that I would ever find someone that I would want to spend my life with. I came here a broken person, and I came here, gave up, and I told the Lord, I said, you know what, Lord, I'm done. I'll just live my life single, and I'll just preach the gospel, and I'll be okay. But when I met you back in August, you brought hope back in my heart again. You let me know that there is someone out there that I can love and someone that loves me. Trying to hold it together. Manage your soul, brother. (laughs) I told you I wanted to do something for you that you didn't know it would be a complete surprise. And I couldn't think of any other way or any better way than to do this and then 
to share this with you is that, Chantel, I love you with all my heart. And when I met you, I realized within a couple of days that all my tears and all my prayers for the past 10 years had, had come to a fruition. And they were standing before me. And like that pastor told me, he said, William, God will never bring her to your doorstep. And that's exactly what he did with you. We live in the same house, we don't know. Not in the same, you know, anyway, I want to go ahead. We live at the convent with a bunch of other people. And God literally brought her to my doorstep. And so Chantel, Rose, Paquette, will you marry me? <laughs> I can't do it. Mm, thank you, baby. <laughs> she said yes, so. <laughs> Anyways, you can sit down, maybe. Uh, <coughs> One more illustration on how to manage your soul. When you saw me shaking earlier, it wasn't just sickness. I was freaking out. <laughs> and so I had to put these principles into action immediately. <laughs> on the spot, before your eyes. So, Shantel, I hope that was a special for you, but. <laughs> I was trying to think of a way to bless her, and I was trying to think of a way to be a complete shock to her without her realizing, that, oh, man, this is about to happen. And this was the only way that I could figure out how to do it. And so, guys, church family, pastors Ben and Micah, I just want to thank you so much for allowing me to come and to share, for being part of my life, and for giving me an opportunity to propose to my bride-to-be, Chantel. Let's give it up for Jesus. <laughs> Paul. Chantel, can I get you to come up here again? <laughs> One of the things that we do at Convergence is we, we do believe that through art uh, that we get words for people. And uh, this morning, Chantel uh, painted this beautiful painting back here, and I just wanted to give her an opportunity to say who it was for and what it was about. Wow. <laughs> Good morning, church. Um, I painted this white rose. It has um, edging with uh, gold around it and um, pink and purple. And I feel like it's for you, um, Sally's daughter. Sally's daughter, Rachel. Um, the father says you are pure at heart, edged in gold, that he is passionately pursuing you, clothing you in royalty. My beautiful rose, you are a songbird. You will bring freedom to many through your songs. It is time to share your voice. He is calling you up to sing. Sing, girl, sing. Yeah, and before we do offering this morning, uh, I wanted to lead us into our, our time of communion. Um, in front of you, in the seat backs, you'll see a little communion cup. And for those of you that are sitting in the front row, I do have one for you as well. Thank you. So, on that night in the upper room, the disciples came with Jesus and they came into this celebration. It was a, basically a feast. And about midway through that celebration, things began to change. Everything got very solemn, and there was accusations of, of deceit and treachery that was uh, brought about. But in that time, something else happened. The disciples were confused. They had no idea what was going on. And then Jesus picks up a cup and a loaf of bread and breaks the bread and tells them that it's his body, to take it and eat it. They also, um, thank you. They also um, brought out a cup of wine, and they took this wine, saying, this is my blood shed for you. Take and drink. And nobody knew what this meant, but here we are 2,000 years later, 
still remembering Jesus in this way. So um, if you're not familiar with your communion cups, you have a wafer in the top. You just peel back the top of it. And what I want to do is I want to bless this, and then we'll remember Jesus in his way. So, Heavenly Father, we just thank you for these elements. We thank you for giving us a way to remember you, God, and honor you, Jesus, for what you did for our salvation. Father, we just bless these elements as your body and your blood, and in your holy name we remember you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. So this is the body broken for you. If you'll lift up your cup, Christ's blood shed for you. It's just another way that um, Christ has never changed. Just another way. When you came in this this morning, you received uh, an bulletins. Did anybody not receive offering envelopes and uh, bulletins? Donna, I have some right by my chair there. So uh, we are a a church family and we have a connection card in all your bulletins. Uh, If you haven't already filled out your connection card, please do so. If you're a first or second time guest, uh, please put in all your information. If not, uh, if you've been here for quite a while and you've been here more than twice, Just check the box marked family for us, and we'll drop that in our offering envelope as our offering goes by today. Um, Before we receive the offering, I just want to tell you uh, something that came to my mind as I was reading my Bible readings this week, and it came out of Romans chapter 7. And in Romans chapter 7, it gives a, uh, it it basically says that the descendants of Levi would become priests and that they would take offering. And there was, this, there was a king that, um, that actually went to Abraham. He was not a descendant of Abraham or, or of Levi, yet he asked for a 10% offering from, from uh, Abraham, and Abraham freely gave it. And through this, even though it wasn't through the, a descendant of Levi, he was blessed, and he was blessed highly. And that's what we do this for. We do this for for blessings, not only for our church and for ourselves, but as to honor God. And um, it's one of the things that we found in our lives that have helped helped bless us, and we do it joyfully, and I hope that everyone does too. So if we can get uh, my couple to come help me up with the offering this morning. And Father, we just thank you for this offering that that we're about to receive. Father, you know the needs of Convergence Center, and you know the needs of this church and the community, Father. We just bless this uh, portion that we give back to you, Lord, as yours. Father, we give our best to you first, and we hold the last till till later. Father, we just ask that you multiply this blessing and this offering this morning in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So, William, uh, 